Hello, everybody, and welcome to a workshop from Midwestern State University's Moffitt Library. This is perfecting your paper. Now, <clears throat> perfecting is a little tongue in cheek because um, there's a very low possibility that any one of us is going to write the perfect paper. But by following some of the guidelines that I'm going to cover today, showing you how best to format your paper, how to format your citations and implement citations into your paper, I think you'll have a pretty good idea of how to, if not perfect your paper, then get it as close to perfect as any one of us possibly can be. Now, uh, before I continue, my name is Chris. I am one of the instruction librarians at Moffitt Library. Uh, I've also, um, I also have a bachelor's degree in English, so I, um, I'm pretty familiar with MLA. I'm currently um, in the middle of my master's in library science. Uh, that will, uh, that will be something coming up soon, but uh, as part of that, I'm also getting much more familiar with APA, so uh, the one style that we'll not be covering as intensively here is the Chicago Manual of Style, but since I know that Midwestern State University uh, does teach uh, certain disciplines with that, I will try to cover it as best as I can. I'm not promising that it'll be perfect, uh, ironically, considering the title of our workshop here, but um, I will um, I will try to cover it as best I can. Uh, and I have a question if uh, you can get a recorded clip afterward. Absolutely. I'm going to type in my email address here and um, email me once this is over. And as soon as we have this uploaded onto the um, the YouTube channel for our library, then I will make sure to send you uh, a link to this uh, workshop as it is. Uh, also, if something happens to my um, to my uh, presentation today, I, I would appreciate getting an email to let me know. Uh, I've done this before in the past, and I didn't realize I had stopped recording until um, about a half hour in because of some glitches. So, uh, yeah, feel free to send me an email for any reason. So. Let us actually go ahead and start on our workshop here. Now, the one question that I really kind of wanted to think about as the, the thesis statement here is, why even do this? Why even bother uh, writing in a certain style and citing our sources and making sure that everything we do is... Uh, well within the style guidelines that we use and follows the consistent patterns of say APA or MLA they're all pretty different but they're all pretty similar and they all have a, a fairly similar thought process behind them uh, the one big reason though that I really came away with is that by writing your research paper and doing your own research you are gaining new information and you're becoming more aware and more critical in the discipline that you are studying. Uh, if you're an English major, maybe focusing on literature, <clears throat> there's a possibility that by doing your research and writing your papers, you are showing that you are more um, not just literate in that you can read really well, but you're also becoming more literate in how you critically process the the works that you're reading and and how you are um, thinking about the themes and ideas of a paper, for example. Maybe you are in the nursing program or some kind of scientific field. By doing research and putting your thoughts on the paper, you are showing that not only do you have your own version of this research that you are synthesizing, but you also know how to find that kind of information, find relevant information, and use that to <clears throat> further uh, um, elucidate your own thoughts and feelings about whatever the subject is. <clears throat> On that note, I, I found that it's it might be an obvious answer, but 
By doing this, you're actually lending greater credibility to the research that you are making uh, by showing that you can find past research, that you are finding research that, that professionals in your field have already put together. You are then showing that, uh, that the research that you are making has already seen uh, the proper steps in place that you are also doing the research you are going to be more credible in your ability to do research as well. <clears throat> and uh, on that topic, you're also crediting your research forebears by doing this. And this might seem like, uh, this might be something that especially if you are just starting out with your research, if you are kind of uh, unsure why you're doing this, if you're questioning why you are having to write a um 2000 word research paper on a topic that you might not care about. Well, it's because the people before you also might have uh, done this research and found that they had something significant to say. They might have decided that this is a field that they are also interested. So by doing the research, you're crediting the people who came before you, who did that research as well, who have put in the time and became professionals in one way or another. Uh, and by doing so, uh, your own research may possibly be used down the line. Maybe someone will find your research particularly helpful for them. Maybe they'll cite your paper and they'll decide that your contributions to the field were actually worth also talking about like your forebears were. <clears throat> Finally, and this does have to be said, it's uh, I don't like always bringing this up because just by uttering the word plagiarism. It's almost like there is an implicit uh, threat here saying that uh, there are people, there are, you might have friends, you might have acquaintances who are guilty of plagiarism. You might, um, you might know somebody very well who is guilty of plagiarism. You might have heard about someone in your class. The point is that I don't necessarily like to say that you might be guilty of plagiarism, but in many cases, plagiarism comes from completely benign and um, unknown sources. It might be something that you are unaware of that actually is a big issue with plagiarism. As MSU Texas students, you have actually um, given your approval to tell the the entire board the all the faculty all the staff here that you will not um, conduct any kind of academic dishonesty and of course the different types of plagiarism there's something like you know uh, you're not citing your sources you are um, purposefully um, paraphrasing someone else's words in the hopes that maybe um, you can pass them off as your own. There are other examples of plagiarism though that you might not be aware of. For example, um, did you know that uh, reusing some of the research that you've done before or repeating some of the, um, <clears throat> some of the uh, same wordage or other types of uh, essay points you've made in the past is also technically plagiarism. That's right, you can actually plagiarize yourself. Uh, some other examples that we're going to cover later is that you might not know this, but you can oversight something and commit plagiarism by not actually writing anything original in your paper. And that seems like that might be uh, counterintuitive. How can I cite too much? Well. We'll get to that and um, a lot more as we continue with this. So there are plenty of reasons why we write our papers and cite and use our very specific examples. Um, but in general, what we want to do is to make sure that we're following the guidelines and the styles to make sure that in general, we are creating a consistent uh, type of research so that it's easier for uh, the people that we are going to have reading our papers actually know that you are following your rules. I mean, it's very easy to see that if you're 
writing your paper and all of your text is in uh, Joker style or whatever it's called or some kind of weird formatting, they can probably see right away that you're not following the rules. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you're going to do, but it's very easy to go ahead and um, and just start things out right by giving a good impression that you know what you're doing. So in order to show that, um, we're going to talk about the three styles mainly uh, that are used here on this campus. Now, there are others. There are different types of, for example, there are different types of Chicago styles. Um, really just depends on your professor, but the two that we're really going to focus on today are the American Psychological Association style, or APA, and the Modern Language Association style, or the MLA. Uh, if you don't have one of these guidebooks or style manuals already, it's very, very highly recommended that you do pick one up. <clears throat> now, the library does have copies of each of these style manuals. Um, we have, as far as I know, we have a copy of the APA and the, the MLA style book uh, in our main collection that can be checked out. We also have one copy of each in the reference section. Now, let's just assume that we have, I'm going to lowball a number and say that we have 300 students who are all trying to write a research paper by the end of the semester. That is a very, very low estimate because I'm going to assume that a vast majority of students will be doing some sort of research each semester that's going to require them to use one of these style manuals. Now, we would like to have all of these on hand so that anyone can use them at any time, but having hundreds of students all want the same one book is going to be very, very difficult to keep track of. So it's highly recommended that you get your own copy of the publication manuals, especially if you are in a discipline that you know will use the same one. It, for example, if you're in a obviously psychology uh, discipline, if you are in science of some sort, medicine, if you're in any field that might even once use the APA style, it's probably a good idea to just pick up a copy of it as soon as possible so that you can keep it along with you throughout your entire degree. The same goes for MLA. If you're going to be in the humanities, if you're writing a bunch of English papers, Go ahead and pick up a copy of the MLA handbook. These books are not super expensive, and while we are very happy to have them available as much as we can, the truth is that if, if you're going to need them a lot, they're going to pay for themselves eventually, uh, and it probably won't take too long to do it. Um, Chicago Manual of Style is mostly used in, say, the histories. And I've personally spoken to some professors who swear by Chicago. They love using it. Um, some students who say that they could never go back from Chicago after starting to use it. Um, it really just depends on what the discipline is and what your professor prefers. Now, <clears throat> we're going to jump forward a little bit and talk about, well, sure, we have all of these different kinds of books, these, these different kinds of styles. How different are they? Well, it really just depends. Let's talk about the similarities first. We have actually quite a few similarities. And for the first one, I'm going to say, again, Chicago might be the same. It probably is. But this is one where I'm mostly talking about MLA and APA. You have acceptable fonts for each. And the two that are the most consistently accepted and the ones that I recommend the most are Arial size 11 font and Times New Roman size 12 font. And in particular, I personally prefer Times New Roman. It just has a bit more of a professional feel to it. Arial looks pretty nice, but I personally just don't prefer it that much. Um, all of your papers are also going to be using double line spacing. Now, if you are coming from a high school, if you are unfamiliar with uh, writing a paper in a specific style, if you're just unsure about um, how this works, especially when it's coming from a uh, a place of, say, a, a high school paper, you're probably going to have been more aware of uh, teachers or, 
or instructors or whoever who give you a specific word count or a, not a word count, a page count limit um, more so than a word count limit. And that might be especially for a um, especially for a grade school paper. It might be something like you have a six page limit to your paper that you're going to write. Um, academia is a, a bit different in this regard in that for the most part, your professors are going to want you to have a specific word count limit. And that's where this comes from. I'm getting a little confused and a little ahead of myself here, but you're probably going to have a professor who, like I said before, will say like, you have a 2000 word count minimum. Uh, you need to make sure that you hit this word count. And it's probably not going to matter how long your paper is in terms of page count. And that's why double line spacing is actually the the big consistent style here. Um, you, you might have heard some, again, I'll go back to uh, grade school, high school, what have you. You might have a professor or a teacher who would tell you, uh, I can spot whenever you're doing uh, specific line spacing because I, I know what to look at. You might have had a teacher who would say, use 1.5 line spacing just because that makes it a little easier to read. When you're dealing with just word count limits, it doesn't really matter how long the the spacing is because you're not going to probably hit a page count limit. And if there if you do, it's because your professor has requested you to keep your paper under 20 pages or so. And 20 pages is a really really massive word count to begin with, so it's probably not going to be a problem of uh, of reaching the maximum limit for a page uh, for a page count. Uh, making sure that you have the word count limit is actually far more important. And by having double line spacing, you're actually giving your professor enough room to write notes for you to correct errors that you might have made or to, I don't know, just point out something in your paper. Maybe they'll have a, a kind word or a praise that they're that they have for whatever phrasing you have. The point is by having double line spacing, you're giving your professor more room to give you feedback. Now, this this is this is an obvious one. This is something that you probably will never even have to worry about at all because it comes default on just about every word processor. But you want to have all your papers uh, written with one inch margins on the top and bottom. This is default in pretty much every type of Word document that I've ever typed on. And again, not only is this to kind of give you more space so that your paper doesn't look uh, like it's just a big jumble of words, but it also gives your professors or your, um, your peers more room to write notes or to point out something on your paper. Now, Usually, uh, most of your papers are going to have some type of header. Now, the header is something written at the top of the page. It's an actually a separate technical part of the page itself. Um, sometimes a professor might want you to write just your last name and include the page number. Sometimes they might want you to have the full title of your paper. They might want you to have your uh, your last name left aligned while the page count is on the right. They might want it to be all on the right side. This is something that I see is typically up to the professor and they'll let you know in the syllabus. Just check with them and make sure that they don't have a very specific requirement that they want you to have for your headers. But from what I've noticed, it's usually with APA style, the header will be on the right hand side followed by the page number. And then with um, with just about everything, obviously, um, even Chicago, which uses footnotes, you'll want to have some page, some type of page that has all of your citations at the end of the paper. By having all of it in one place, your professor can see where you've cited your source, and then they can go back to the end. They'll know exactly where it is. Um, if you're following your style guide correctly, all of your citations will be in alphabetical order, usually by author. They'll be able to see the person you've cited, and then they'll be able to go back to the end of the book and, uh, or to the end of your paper and say, okay, this is that citation. This is where they got it from. If I'm unsure about the citation, I can go and refer to it here as they have mentioned it. And that's usually why uh, most professors will ask you to keep a, uh, a link 
to the page. That's why whenever you are using something like um, an EBSCOhost vendor uh, database, they will include the DOI. Um, we'll see a little bit of that as we go along, but the DOI, uh, in case you weren't aware, the, is the digital object identifier. It is a way of uh, keeping track of individual articles and other types of written work uh, so that no matter what system you're using, they'll always be attached to this one uh, digital object identifier. Now, sure, we have a lot of similarities. And as you are just typing up your paper, it's very easy to, to just start and get some stuff out of the way before you actually finish writing. In fact, I have an example of that here. Um, I'll show you what this will actually look like. Um, can everyone see me switching over to Word document, uh, to, uh, to my Word document here? Yes. Okay, great. So for example, you might have your, um, your first little bit here. Maybe you'll, you're writing MLA, which doesn't have a title page. MLA will have a, um, a section at the start of your paper where, where you will type your name out and your class, et cetera. We'll see that later. Um, but to make things easier on you, it actually wouldn't hurt for you to just do all of your formatting at the very beginning. So this paper has already kind of gotten uh, most of its formatting out of the way. So what you can do here, change your font to whatever style you're using. I'm using times 12. Um, on the view tab, You'll notice that I have the ruler checked. Um, I'm using Office 2016 right now, actually. Um, but in some regards, I've seen that, especially the more recent versions of Office will have the ruler turned off and your paper will look like this to start with. Uh, this is still not so difficult. Uh, even if you don't have the ruler on your page, you can still do quite a bit without needing it. But I find it's easier so that as I'm typing, I can just change my uh, indentations and my um, my margins as I need them. Um, you you might want to keep it open though, just because it makes uh, it makes writing your paper so much easier, and you can do all of this in real time. Now, from the layout page. You'll see that a lot of this stuff will will kind of give you a little bit of numbers. If you uh, were to click on margins, it'll give you a just a few examples of the margins you can use. Um, it's actually easier to click on the uh, this drop down here because then you can change everything one by one, and it doesn't take very long to get this done. Um, in fact, like I said, this I didn't have to touch anything to make sure that all the margins were one inch on all sides. <clears throat> Same goes for paragraph, but you'll notice, for example, um, when I started writing this paper, it had the um, the line spacing as eight points after the paragraph. Now, instead of messing around with all of this and making sure everything's one by one, again, like the page setup, you can get the paragraph list out uh, and just kind of uh, make sure everything is good to go beforehand. Uh, set all of your spacing uh, to zero afterwards. Um, if you wanted to uh, get your indentation out of the way, you can uh, you can do that here as well. Um, I've seen um, for line spacing, the default set at multiple. It just depends on uh, whatever your default settings are. But this is simple to just go in and change to double line spacing. So everything is going to, um, everything will be double line spaced. It will be set up exactly as you need it to. You don't have to do anything else to set up your paper after you're done. From here, all you would need to do is say, um, for example, let's say I'm writing an MLA paper. I can do all this stuff to make sure that my title is good to go. I, I set this up already. Uh, from here, then I can write the, um, the title of the paper, and that would just be paper title, et cetera. And then when I skip the next line, after readjusting to my alignment, then all I have to do is set my indentations right here in real time, and you're good to go. You can start writing your paper, and it's 
pretty much uh, from there, it's all good to go and you don't have to touch anything else. I always recommend getting your formatting out of the way so that you don't have to worry about it later on while you're in the middle of doing your intense research and trying to put your thoughts onto the page. Because that's a lot more difficult than, than you would be led to believe, especially if you're not very familiar with writing a paper yet. It actually... I'd say that that's the hardest part of me writing a paper is just trying to figure out how to start talking about my thoughts on the topic. Now, uh, let's go back to our PowerPoint here. I talked about all the similarities and how you can, no matter what the style is, how you can set that stuff up. But then, of course, we have differences, and boy, oh boy, are all of these uh, styles very different in certain aspects. Uh, for example, for the APA 7th edition, you have a few different sections of your paper. For example, APA, uh, as far as I know, CMOS, actually, no, I, I take that back. CMOS also has this as one of its uh, uh its main similarities with APA in that they both have a title page. Uh, with this, you'll have the title of your paper, your name, your professor's name, all of the relevant information will all be on that front page so that it is technically separated out from the rest of your paper. Uh, then you'll have the abstract that begins on the second page. And the abstract is just to say that you are Describing the paper in uh, brief detail, you are telling the reader what it is that they are about to see summarized in maybe a paragraph. Uh, on this second page as well, this is where you will start putting down your, uh, your page count. Your professor doesn't really want to see your whole title page here, everything set up beautifully with the, the centered text and everything else, and then just a random number in the corner. That really breaks up the flow of the, I would almost say, artistry of, of the whole uh, setup of the title page. Um, from there, APA then has the main body of the paper. Uh, you might see them broken down into um, the research then the findings, um, proposals for how to implement this research. And finally, then you'll see the conclusion, of course, and then the reference page. Uh, all of these styles will have different types of citation pages at the very end. APA uses a reference page. We'll see examples of that as we move further along. But if you look at them at a glance, they seem kind of similar but they all have their differences in, in some minor and some major ways. Um, APA uses in-text citations. Uh, this just means that as you are uh, writing your paper, you will cite your source and then you will use a parenthetical phrase. Uh, you'll use parentheses, which will have the author's name, the, uh, the page count, wherever... Uh, wherever you got your article from. Uh, an exact APA citation will be last name of the uh, the researcher or the author of the article, or if you're using uh, an article with multiple sources, you'll write the last name, comma, last name, last name, comma, and last person on the list. You know, you might have a paper with four authors and you need to make sure that you're crediting all of them with your source. Uh, some papers will use and some styles will say write the first three names or write the first five names and then uh finish with et al i don't know what et al stands for i probably should but th it happens um that is followed up by the year of the publication and then the page count where you got your information from you want to always be able to allow Whoever's reading your paper, be it uh, your peers, be it your professors, be it fellow researchers, you want them to be able to go back to the citation that you made and then go back and see exactly how it is that you found this. Maybe they need to see the context for your, your quote as well. Um, I've seen multiple instances where people will think that they have the perfect quote, and in context, it's literally the opposite of what the author was saying and that's actually a, a big no-no uh, make sure that you are that you are using sources that support your argument 
<clears throat> now, MLA does have a few things that are seemingly pretty close to the APA style, but they're not really so much. Um, for example, you'll have uh, numbered sections. This is a newer. Uh, uh, this is a newer uh, update with MLA. When again, when I was in college, there were no sections with MLA. I think this may be to keep MLA more in line with APA. Uh, I'm not really too sure, but now we're seeing uh, MLA papers written with. A, uh, a section that will have a number to differentiate it, followed by a heading to describe that section. It might not just be main body uh, findings, etc. It might be something that describes that section. Um, unlike the APA uh, running header, the running header on MLA starts on page one, along with the rest of your paper. Maybe um, Maybe there are instances where your professor will say start the header on page two because um, rather than having a title page, you include all of that information on the first page of an MLA paper. And maybe having all of that in one place could be a little cluttered. It really just depends, again, on what your professor wants. And again, having uh, all of that information in one place. Um, I almost always see that left aligned, but your professor might actually want it to be right aligned. Again, this is something that you would need to either look in the syllabus that your professor has provided you or just ask them. If there's anything that you are unaware of or that you're unsure about, I very, very highly doubt your professor is going to be um, upset or annoyed at you telling them that you are interested in writing something perfectly or exactly as they want it to be seen. In fact, they're probably going to be way, way more thankful that you are showing an interest. Uh, finally, rather than having a reference sheet at the end of the paper, MLA uses a works cited page. And since we're covering all three of these major uh, styles as, as well, um, for the Chicago Manual of Style, we go back to sections kind of like APA. You have a title page, the main body, um, then your references. This uh, CMOS, as far as I'm aware, does not use an abstract, which summarizes the rest of the paper. It's kind of a mix and match between MLA and APA. Uh, the header begins on the page with the main body, again, like the APA style. Unlike APA or MLA, Chicago Manual of Style uses footnotes, and we'll see examples of that with some of the pages that I have from sample papers, but uh, the big difference here is that when you're writing an APA or an MLA paper, you're writing your in-text citations so that your professor can see all of your paper and they can, they can see uh, where it is that you have cited your source. With Chicago, what you're doing instead is saying, this is my source. If you check down at the bottom of the page in the footnote, you can see exactly where the source is. And you'll fully sort, you'll fully cite that, that one source the first time you use it. The major uh, advantage of this is that it allows your paper to, to flow naturally and be unbroken compared to having the in-text citations. And of course, the, the citations, when they're in text, they don't really break up the paper that much, but it allows it to flow even better and kind of tell a story as opposed to being uh, strictly in text, uh, if that makes sense. Um, Chicago also uses, uh, depending on the type of paper and depending on your uh, professor's preference, you'll either have a bibliography or a reference sheet uh, at the very end of your paper. Um, reference, of course, being similar to the APA style, but bibliography is a little bit different. And for these, whereas you, uh, whereas you cite the last name of the author followed by the first name, um, from what I've seen, Chicago actually just has you do the full name of uh, that researcher all in, all as they would appear like on their birth certificate. So let's look at some examples, starting with APA. And we might actually, since I know, um, I, I believe all of our guests today are um, <laughs> are using APA style. 
um it's probably better to focus on this than to break it up evenly into this and then mla where it won't be as useful uh i know this is a little difficult to see uh, and i'm i'm exaggerating i know this is very difficult to see but this is just because i grabbed these uh these example papers off of and if you look at the um the link that I cited here from the Owl Purdue website. This is specifically their page on how to uh, use APA formatting and how to best use the style as it is written down in the style book. This is just the general format for an average paper that you would see. First off, we have the title page uh, about a third of the way down, and they're actually doing it wrong because they have the um, the footnote on the first page. Again, I highly, highly doubt your professor is going to want you to do that. Um, about a third of the way down, you see that the title of the of the article, the the essay that you were writing, is written in bold. And here we see that the title is actually quite descriptive. You have one line that goes over the basic title of the paper. And for this one, they have written down the Purdue Writing Lab title page, followed by a colon. The second line is uh, following the American Psychological Association's guidelines. The second line of your uh, of your essay is actually going to be describing your paper and describing a little bit more about the specifics of the paper itself. About halfway down, that's uh, a, a few spaces after the title page, and you'll see that um, the the author here has written their name, the department and university where they're writing for, the name of the course, which includes the uh, course code, the professor's name who is teaching the course, and then the due date of the paper. Uh, following this, you'll have a page break. If you're unsure how to page break, uh, you, hold control, you hold the control key and press enter. That allows you to skip right to the second page or the next page of your paper. Um, which reminds me, since we were talking about Word before, as you are doing all of your uh, uh, all of your formatting, it really doesn't hurt to just do that page break. And you can see here the page break is shown as a a literal line. You can change it to uh, showing just um, just a second page. Totally depends on how you want this to look because when it appears to your professor, it'll be in the format that they have their words set up. Um, but as you start doing this, it really doesn't hurt to just start your second page and just type in, say, references, and then start doing your uh, your formatting as as it'll show up later on. So you type your references, a uh, reference page for for uh, APA works cited page for MLA, even Chicago styles. Um, all of these will be consistent in that you want to have a um, no indent on the first line and then a half inch indent over uh, the normal margin for your papers. So um, when you're writing here, uh, I'm just gonna fill out the line so you can see what it looks like. I'm just gonna hold down the last key that I was on. And when it skips to the next line, it will automatically jump over to the half inch indent. So once you get this all set up at the start of your paper, again, it makes it so much easier to just continue writing your paper and not worry about doing all this formatting later because it, it might actually, um, it might distract you from the rest of the paper you're writing. Uh, the second page here, we can see that the uh, the author has written their abstract. I've seen from uh, some academic writers where they will have a um, a different kind of abstract. I, I don't write in academic papers myself, so I'm probably speaking to nobody here when I'm mentioning this, but uh, I have seen some, uh, some papers that have, uh, as an academic writer, you'll have a smaller type of abstract, and then you'll write the full abstract on the second page. This is just me telling you things that I am aware of, nothing that I've ever had to do or see or implement on any paper that I've ever written. Um, but the second page is where you'll write your abstract, and you'll see 
that this author actually included their own keywords. And keywords are just there to, um, to help your reader know exactly what the subject or the genre of your essay will be. Let's say you're writing a paper on child psychology. Here you would write keywords, child psychology. That'll be an easy way for them to say, okay, well, here's what the paper will be. When I'm going into it and reading it, I'll know that this is what the paper will be like. Uh, the abstract as well is a paragraph long uh, summary of the paper as it will show up. Uh, finally, I have listed or I have shown here uh, the bibliography.com example of an APA reference sheet. Uh, they have some tips as they're shown here with the color coded alignment to uh, draw your eye exactly to where this is going to, uh, these points are going to look. Um, for example, hanging indent for anything that's more than one line. I already showed you how to do that. Um, left align running head that's uh, shown on the abstract page as well. But this um, this just includes your title. So your professor knows that your paper is all uh, in is all together. <laughs> He's not mixing it up with someone else's. Uh, then the um, the abstract page only shows the uh, page number. The reference page here has an example of the author's last name before the uh, the page number. And this, that takes actually a little bit of uh, finesse to, um, to get that formatting right, but um, it's not the most difficult thing in the world. And usually, as I said, if you start your paper off by getting all of that formatting out of the way, then the hard stuff is over. Um, next, we have a few more examples, again, taken from Al Purdue, of uh, just how a paper might look as you're writing it in APA format. You can see that um, we have a section for the main body page where um, they wrote down the title of the paper. Then next, they had literature review. This is showing that they are uh, implementing the literature or the research that they've made to um, to describe some of the the research that helps out with the theme of their paper. Uh, from there, then you have uh, another section called materials and methods where they start to tell you about the research that they did on their own. Um, MLA, you can see that the the paper is quite a bit different from just the uh, from just that first page that we looked at. Uh, rather than having the title page, all the information on the title, is in the upper left corner of this uh, of this paper. Again, I've seen professors who prefer it right aligned. I've seen some professors who ask for APA style um, papers that want, rather than the title page, that want this style of um, of uh, summary of yourself, your professor, class, etc. Um, that's something again that will be pointed out in the course syllabus. And after this, uh, the author wrote down the title of the paper and then started writing. Uh, as I said before, when I was writing uh, MLA as an undergrad a decade ago, um, there were no, um, no numbered sections in MLA. And I don't know how hard and fast that rule is, since it was something that I saw Al Purdue very specifically point out and we'll see examples of. I have to imagine it's... Uh, it's something that uh, is being enforced these days. But as you can see from this, there is no, uh, no break in the paper format. And the works cited page does look quite a bit similar to the APA uh, reference sheet. Uh, one of the biggest differences here is that the, the format of the date is different. For APA, the date will be um, in parentheses after the name and it will, just be the year that the that the article was published. From there, you have the title of the article written in italics, but one of the biggest differences, and you'll notice it here if, if you look at the Works Cited page. Um, on a Works Cited page in MLA, the title is in quotes, and all of the proper nouns are capitalized. So you can see here, first one, executive on a mission, saving the planet. The only thing that's not capitalized are those like uh, on a, the, etc. Um, 
going down a little further, avoiding self-organized extinction. All the words are capitalized except for A of, etc. If you're writing an APA format, the only word that gets its first letter capitalized is the first word of a sentence or the first word following a colon. It's very important, especially if you're using an auto-generated uh, citation maker, even if you're using it on one of our databases. Sometimes those uh, those citation generators will not include capitalization correctly. You will have to uh, go through and change those yourself. Um, it just depends on the style you're using, but once you start using it often and consistently, you'll be able to spot those little, little things that need to be changed as soon as you start putting them down in your references or work cited page. Here are a few other examples of uh, an MLA format. You can see that they have their, uh, their sections. They're not numbered, but they still are showing here. Um, the paragraph following a new section is not, um, does not have an indentation. Um, little things here that make MLA, I guess this is a new format of MLA because um, again, uh, this is, it's new to me. Um, so a few notes about uh, in-text citations. Uh, you'll follow all quotes with parentheses. It'll be quote, 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 then parentheses, uh, name of the author, and the, the page number that you got it from. Um, the name of the author is not necessary to write down in your citation if you've already named them in your uh, in your sentence. So example, if you're saying, um, if you're citing me, if you said, Deepanetta said, and then followed it up with your quote, when you do the par the parentheses for the citation, you won't have to type my name out again, as, because I know I have a difficult name to type out to begin with. But you won't have to type it out again, because you already did. You already cited me as your source. So all you have to do is just show where exactly you got that information from, be it the page count or whatever else. Um, if you are... Uh, if you're citing for APA, all you would have to do there, say if I were writing something down on an HTML website, you know, something that's just a basic website, obviously there are no page counts for that. So all you'd have to do is put in a parentheses. Um, the date is only needed for APA though. MLA does not need that. So long as you put down the name, that's your citation. Um, but always make sure to include page numbers so long as it's there. It's there. And rather than... Um, Say if you're opening up a PDF in um, in Adobe or something, you'll have two different versions of the page number. The first one is actually what you need to avoid, and it will be if you have a 17-page paper and you are using that to uh, as a citation or for your research, you won't put down that, say, the fifth page of your 17 paper is where you got your information, so uh, you might put down, in parentheses, page five. What you actually need to do is include the page number on the page itself. You might be getting this information or you might be getting this article from a journal, from a journal that has hundreds, if not thousands of pages. That's how we actually find where that article is. It might be page 320 to page 337. So you would actually be citing if you were on the fifth page of that, uh, rather than, uh, than showing up as page five, you'll see on that page that it will be more like page 325. And that's the page number that you'd actually cite. Now, here's something else that I only learned about this year, because as I said, I don't I have never used APA all that much until starting my own library science degree. Being used to the way MLA is formatted, I always just put in the quotes to support my argument and just moved on as I would with MLA. Now, what I've been been told, what I've been told by uh, professionals who write an APA, who grade APA papers, is that you want to do your best to paraphrase whatever it is the quote that that you're using 
because by paraphrasing, you're then taking the the words and and research that someone else has uh, has already made, and you're synthesizing it with your own thoughts and your own view of this research. And by putting in that citation, what you're doing is saying, I'm telling you how I feel by also integrating it with someone else's work. This is showing your professor that you know the the exact subject enough that you can integrate it with someone else who's done the research before. It really shows the professor that you know what you're talking about, that you know the subject enough that you can be trusted to put it into your own words. Um, this does become a problem if you forget to cite your sources. Again, uh, the difference between plagiarism and integrating and synthesizing your own voice is just that one citation. You might include that citation at the very end of your um, at the very end of your paper. And this is one of the big reasons why the date is not so much needed for MLA because your professor, if you're writing an MLA, will know you're citing because they'll see those big old quotation marks where the paper where the source is being cited. If you are writing an APA and you're paraphrasing, they need to know what you're paraphrasing from. Uh, you might say the name of that person. Uh, you might give the author's name or the source's name and then paraphrase it. But then you still have to let them know, hey, I am, you know, I am paraphrasing it. And here's where you can see the original phrase if you would like to uh, double check. But that's the difference in being a very careful uh, uh, writer and being someone who is not worried about plagiarism, which you really should be. Um, here are a few examples of citation pages. Um, we've got the bibliography for the Chicago Manual of Style. Uh, you can see that they use um, this one. They use last name and first name. Uh, I've seen other examples of Chicago where they use first name, last name, as I said earlier. Uh, the reference sheet for APA, the MLA style works cited sheet, the works cited and the references are going to be the two that look the most similar, but uh, Chicago's bibliography and the reference sheet are similar in their own ways as well. But you really need to make sure that you are um, following the exact guidelines depending on your style guide. <clears throat> now, some of you... Some of you may be familiar with or have heard the phrase annotated bibliography. The annotated bibliography, even as a librarian, even having done this, I will admit is kind of scary. Uh, here's an example, also again, taken from Al Perdue. Um, they, they did a lot of heavy lifting for me. Uh, well, hold on, let me, let me rephrase that. They did a lot of heavy lifting for me as a librarian. Think of what they can do for you as a student. They are extremely useful and a great resource. Uh, here are some reasons why you would do an annotated bibliography. So here in the example, um, they're, they're kind of telling you what uh, a bibliography is by definition and what an annotation is by definition. And a bi bibliography is just your list of sources. It's your reference page, or your works cited page, or it's literally your bibliography or, or what have you. And it's just your way of including all of the citations you've made and all the sources that you put into your paper. An annotation, on the other hand, is like you describing or summarizing the source so that you can show why it is that this is important. Um, <clears throat> you include the two words together and you get an annotated bibliography and it's a list of sources that you're using and why you're using them, right? Uh, very simple to keep that in mind. Now, this is something that we kind of teach uh, how to do, even if you're not required to do an annotated bibliography. Um, library science has something that we call the CRAAP test, C-R-A-P, or depending, it might be C-R-A-A-P. Um, this stands for currency, relevancy, authority, authorship, or one or the other, and the purpose or point of view. It's a very quick way of deciding whether or not an, uh, an article or a bit of research is going to be useful for your paper. Now, an annotated bibliography is a little bit more complicated than just looking at it uh, and 
including it on your list of possible citations. What you're doing here is that you are summarizing the the article, the source that you're using, so you can give a brief description of what it is that the site that the source is about. You are then determining whether or not the source itself is um, is uh, useful for you. Maybe it's something that um, is useful for the field itself. Maybe it's not useful for the field, but it is useful for your research. And then you say why it is that you've decided to include it in your paper. Now, you might have a professor who says, I need you to have a half dozen sources by the end of the semester, but I want you to go ahead and make your annotated bibliography and have 10 sources on the subject. And by doing this, you're, you are giving yourself more wiggle room so you can determine as you are putting in your, your research for your paper, all right, I've got 10 sources here. And from my annotations, I can already see this one doesn't work, this one doesn't work, and this one doesn't really work either. So even though you had to throw out three already, you started with 10, you still have seven. And this isn't a, a hard and fast, like these 10 sources are the ones you have to use for your paper. This is just saying that you've already done research as you're beginning your paper. And even though you have 10 sources, maybe you have a very narrow topic, maybe you need to do more research, you can still add uh, sources to your paper. The annotated bibliography is just showing your professor that you know what you're talking about. Uh, here are some examples of in-text citations, but I've kind of already covered these uh, pretty well. You can see that APA does have an example here where, uh, where they include uh, full quotations for a source. Um, again, from what I've heard from professionals, if you're writing an APA, it might be much, much better for you to paraphrase your source. Um, MLA, on the other hand, is, is going to be very highly um, focused on you uh, putting in the direct quotes so that they can, um, they can bolster your argument rather than you specifically integrating them into your paper. Now, since... Um, since the people who are here um, watching this live have already told me that they're not going to be using Chicago, uh, it's not as important to cover footnotes, but there is a reason why I wanted to show you what the footnote citation looks like. <clears throat> now, from here, we can see that the, um, the footnotes are, as soon as a quotation is done, you can see where the footnote is. And as you can see it, if you, uh, if you compare it to the... Um, to the in-text version, it really does flow quite a bit better. You don't have to um, to have that citation in the middle of your, your thoughts or your what have you, uh, especially using something like Word. You can include all of your, uh, your sources in a list and just click a button and it'll uh, cite it for you. Uh, in particular, on the second page of this, you can see that uh, as an example of a source that was already cited. Once you start using uh, that same source to uh, to uh, use as quotes in your paper, you only have to do a footnote with their name and the page number, and then you move on. <clears throat> now, why I really wanted to show this is just to give an example of what it looks like by um, by utilizing a lot of quotes in your paper. Now, let's say. The, the second page, I use an example here. The first page, I use an example here. They only have two and four citations. So uh, because a footnote uh, uh, citation will uh, use up the footer of your page, um, you can actually get an idea of how many times uh, the writer is citing a source. And what I really wanted to point out here is um, I believe I mentioned this before, but one example, a really strange example of plagiarism is overly quoting something. So let's say um, you're not too sure about your subject and you're using a whole lot of quotes to make your point. If 
I were to say, put your quotations in a footnote uh, system and then look at how many times you've quoted a paper or you've quoted one specific article. If half of your page, if two thirds of your page is all quotations, that's a good way for me to say, you haven't done any, any work on your own. You're only regurgitating what someone else has already wrote. As, um, as strange as that may sound, that is still plagiarism because you are not putting any original thoughts or ideas into your own paper. Professors don't want to see you uh, using other people's research entirely to make an argument. They want to see that you are taking ideas from your research, you've taken ideas from your own understanding and your own critical thoughts, and you are pulling them all together to make your own argument. And they want to see that you are using professionals and other writers in the field to bolster your arguments to say, I know that what I'm saying, if not objectively true, has some standing uh, in terms of um, in terms of research, in terms of some matter of truth that has been put out from other researchers. So um, even if you're not using a footnote to uh, to write your paper, maybe think of that as you are using your own citations and saying, well, I've quoted this this one paper an awful lot. I've got a lot of citations on this one page. Maybe it would be better to to rather than cite everything to allow your thoughts to flow freely to put more of yourself into your paper as opposed to just one one quote and one thought from someone else after another so just just so that i'm in all manner of fairness just so i show you that here are my sources for <laughs> for the um presentation and some of the images that I used. I used bibliography.com for a bit, and I especially used Al Purdue for a lot of the very big examples, some of the pictures that I showed from, um, from example papers. So before I uh, uh, turn off the recording, does anyone have any questions that they can type in the chat, something that I can cover really quickly that you think needs to be um, addressed for the recording of this video. No? Okay, I'm going to um, turn off the recording. <laughs> 